So I do want to welcome everyone. My name is Melanie Parker. I am the founder of the Whole Family Foundation. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Whole Family Foundation, what we do is we help families who have somebody with a disability. So whether that's a child, a parent, a spouse, any member of your family, our goal is to help the whole family unit, to see the whole family, not just the person with the disability, but to educate, to empower and connect these families with the resources that they need to thrive, to be more balanced as a family. Um, our whole board either has someone in their family with a disability or has a disability themselves, um, minus one person who can be our outside the disability community perspective. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen for just a moment. I'm going to show you um, our website. So this is our website. It's the wholefamilyfoundation.com. If you want to go, you can learn more about us. Uh, there's a video that talks about who we are and what we're doing. Um, and But the biggest part is this right here is under the resources tab. So under that tab, if you scroll down, there's lots of different categories. So depending on what you're looking for, there's lots of other nonprofits you can connect with. There's things just for kids. There's some articles about travel. There's different places you can get uh, equipment and other resources and things like that that you might need. So if you're a clinician you want or um, want to share this with your patients, or if you are someone um, who's helping others in the community, then by all means, please share this. If there's a resource that you love and use a lot that's not on this page, please let us know because we want it to be up to date. We want it to be kind of a one-stop shop for people um, who are looking for those resources. So I just wanted to put that out there. So <clears throat> We're gonna go ahead and hop on in and we are gonna turn the presentation over to Miss Lucy. Um, and I'm gonna start her presentation. And then, like I said, she's going to, we're gonna pause the presentation once in a while. She's gonna let us know when she needs to make a correction because the, the presentation that we're gonna be sharing, there have been some changes. So we wanna provide you with the most up-to-date information as far as all that goes. Okay, great. So let's get started here. Hello, and welcome to Virginia Medicaid Waivers, a presentation by the ARC of Virginia. This is especially for individuals with developmental disabilities, family members, educators, and disability service providers who want to learn the basics about Medicaid waivers for people with or at risk of developmental disabilities. The Ark of Virginia is a state chapter of the Ark of the United States, the nation's oldest and largest organization of and for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families. The Ark's mission is to promote and protect the human rights of people with or at risk of developmental disabilities and actively support their full inclusion and participation in the community throughout their lifetime. In this presentation, we're going to cover Medicaid health insurance, Medicaid waivers, waiver services, eligibility criteria, the application process, and tell you how you can get help and more information resources. Most people find that they have questions, but they also find that as the presentation goes on and goes into deeper detail, their questions are answered. But we welcome any questions that you may not have that may not be covered. If you're totally new to waivers, the information can be overwhelming, but don't worry if it doesn't make sense all at once. Let's get started. Let's look at the terms Medicaid and the term waiver separately to understand what they mean. Medicaid is the insurance that pays for waiver services. Waiver means that the requirement that Medicaid services be provided to all in the state is not required. Instead, the services in the waiver are only for select populations. So put together, a Medicaid waiver provides the insurance that pays for the services that are only available to a select defined population. When a person has a Medicaid waiver, they have the health insurance, 
that people with Medicaid have, and they have access to additional waiver services that only people with Medicaid waivers may use. Medicaid waivers, also known as home and community-based care waivers, were created so that states could provide alternatives to having to live in an institution such as a nursing facility or a hospital-like setting to get needed services. Let's look at the what and the why of Medicaid waivers. A Medicaid waiver is a long-term support system for people of any age with long-term care needs. Many people with developmental disabilities have those long-term care needs. The waiver offers a menu of services and supports for people to live in the community versus the nursing home or the hospital-like environment. There are numerous waiver services, including things like personal care, respite, employment services, daytime services, residential supports, skill building services, nursing, environmental modifications, and much more depending on the type of waiver. Waivers are the only public funding source for long-term developmental disability supports. So you may be used to having services if you're a school age person and having all those services paid for. But once you leave the public school system, there is no entitlement service and waivers are the only long-term funding source. Medicaid is overseen by the state and federal government. Virginia State Medicaid Agency is the Department of Medical Assistance Services or DMAS. The federal agency is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or CMS. Both of these agencies have financial and regulatory roles. You may be wondering who pays for Medicaid waivers. Waivers come from state and federal tax dollars. When a state decides to have a Medicaid program, and it does so happen that every state in the US does, the federal government mandates that certain services be provided. And they are all listed here on the slide. EPSDT is a set of services that are only available to children starting at birth up until the 21st birthday. The other mandated services include family planning, health clinics, home health services, hospital services, lab and x-ray services, Medicare premiums, nurse midwife services, nurse practitioner, nursing facilities, physician services, and transportation. States may choose to provide optional services, and Virginia has chosen to provide these optional services. Case management, home and community-based waivers, hospice, intermediate care facilities for people with developmental disabilities, mental health, psychology, optometry, physical, occupational, and speech therapies, podiatry, prescribed drugs, prosthetics, and home health. What is noteworthy on here is to realize that home and community-based waivers are an optional service that states may choose to provide, but they don't have to. For adults with Medicaid waivers, some people may have to pay for some DD or CCC plus Medicaid waivers if they have income over $1,292 per month. This is called patient pay. It is paid each month. There are some exceptions for people who are working. Once a person has a waiver, then they must apply for Medicaid if they don't already have Medicaid health insurance. They will have a Medicaid card, they will have the Medicaid health insurance, and they are eligible for the services in the waiver that they have received. Most people will be enrolled in a Medicaid managed care organization. CCC Plus or Commonwealth Coordinated Care Plus, that's the name for two separate things that share the same name, CCC Plus. So it can get kind of confusing. Those two different things are the CCC Plus Managed Health Care and CCC Plus Waiver Services, but they are two different things. HIP, 
the health insurance premium payment program. This is a Medicaid program. So for Medicaid members who also have employer-based health insurance, the employee may be eligible for the health insurance premium payment program. What HIP does is pay a portion or the total health insurance premium for qualifying plans by reimbursing an employee. So an example would be um, a person has a waiver, one of their parents has an employer-based health insurance plan that qualifies for the HIP program. There's certain qualifications that apply. And let's say the premium that the family pays uh, that comes out of the employee's um, check is $600 a month. Well, it's possible um, if the person meets the HIP criteria that that employee will get reimbursed that $600 a month every month. So an application separate from Medicaid app uh, eligibility has to be filed with the Department of Medical Assistance Services. You may call 800-432-5924 for more information. And on the slide, you see the website address to learn more about the HIP program. The two waiver programs that we're going to talk about are the DD or Developmental Disability Waiver Program and the CCC Plus or Commonwealth Coordinated Care Plus Waiver. So in the Developmental Disability Waiver, which we'll just refer to as DD Waiver, there are three subtypes of waivers. They are the community living, the family and individual supports, and the building independence waiver. The other waiver program is the Commonwealth Coordinated Care Plus waiver program. It does not have subtypes like the DD waiver. The CCC Plus waiver was created in 2017 when the old EDCD and tech waivers were combined into the new CCC Plus waiver. Let's compare these two waiver programs. Looking at the DD waiver program, a person must have a developmental disability diagnosis. It provides a comprehensive menu of up to 32 services for home, work, community, medical care, skill building, and much more. Up to 24-7 support is available through this waiver. It has a large but needs-based waiting list and it's operated by the local community services boards. Let's go over and look at the CCC Plus waiver. You must have a disability diagnosis. And note, I did not say developmental disability diagnosis. And a medical need. That is very important that the person must have a medical need. There are fewer services in this waiver, about nine services. They're more focused on care in the home. Care can be provided in the community. It has nursing, but it does not have employment or residential supports or skill building services available in it. It does not have 24-7 support. There is no waiting list, and it is operated by the local health and social services departments. To be eligible for a waiver, there are three criteria that a person must meet. They are diagnostic criteria, functional criteria, and financial criteria. The financial criteria is the same for both waiver programs. Many people think that for Medicaid waivers, the parent or family income is considered. That is not true. Parent family income never counts for the person who has the waiver. There's no resource limit for children. So a child could have millions of dollars and there's no resource limit for children. But once that child or any person 18 years or older there is a monthly income limit of $2,349, that's per month, and there's a resource limit of $2,000. Now we're going to focus only on the CCC Plus waiver and the services that it provides and the application process. 
The CCC Plus waiver has adult day health care, personal assistance services, private duty nursing, respite care, services facilitation, assistive technology, environmental modifications, personal emergency response system, and transition services. We're going to take a look at personal and attendant care. That's a service that most frequently is used by people who have this waiver. So for personal attendant care, a child or adult receives assistance from an attendant to help them with everyday activities such as dressing, bathing, eating, toileting, and supervision. Some waiver services may be delivered through the consumer directed model. In the consumer directed model, the person with the waiver or their parent or family acting on their behalf recruits, hires, trains, supervises, and fires the attendants. In the agency model, attendants are provided by an agency who handles all of those functions, the recruiting, the hiring, the supervising. The rule for this service is that parents of minor children and spouses of those with waivers were not allowed to be paid as care attendants. Parents of children 18 and older may be, may be paid as attendants. However, due to COVID-19, parents of minors and spouses of people with the waiver may be paid as attendants. As of now, this flexibility is in effect until January 26, 2020. Lucia, there you go. Can you hear us? Okay. Thank you. So I recognize so many of you people on this list and you're probably very familiar with what I'm going to say. That um, exception where parents of minor children and spouses of people who have waivers could be paid attendance um, has been extended through March 11th. And we hope to hear in the next few weeks, well, actually in the next few days, hopefully within a week, whether that um, um, allowance is going to be extended any further. So that's the update on that. Thank you so much. One, and I also want you to make note that this same service is also available in the DD waiver. Assistive technology pays for technology that assists the person with the waiver to be more independent in activities of daily living and communication. Devices are usually portable and may include specialized medical equipment, communication devices, or controls. And to use this service, there is a process. It involves getting a prescription for an AT evalu evaluation um, from a qualified Medicaid professional and it is limited to $5,000 per year. So a person may have purchased up to $5,000 worth of assistive technology per calendar year. This is also available in the DD waiver. Environmental modifications are physical adaptations to the home, vehicle, or work site that enable the person to function with greater independence, to help ensure safety and welfare of the individual. So there may be modifications to the home, which could be anything like a ramp, making rooms accessible, security features. Modifications to a primary vehicle might include lifts, ramps, hand controls. This is also limited to $5,000 per calendar year. And environmental mods is also available in the DD waiver. Private duty nursing is continuous care up to 16 hours a day. It's only covered if there is no private health insurance. You have to meet very specific criteria using highly specialized medical technological support. So a person on a ventilator uh, might be a person who would be using private duty nursing. And this is also available in the DD waiver. Respite gives the caregiver, the parent, a break from providing care. It also gives the person with the, in, with the waiver a break from their caregiver. 
And this may be provided in any environment. It could be in the person's home, the person could go to someone else's home or go to some other environment. 480 hours of respite is permitted per year. This is a consumer directed and an agency directed service. It's also available in the DD waiver. Adult day health care that usually takes place in a group setting where some people gather together. Uh, they engage in social and recreational activities. It's typically used by people who are elderly or who cannot be left alone. Transitional services are for people who are transitioning from a nursing facility to a community home. It provides up to $5,000 for expenses of making that transition to move into their new home. The personal emergency response system, faint life alert, or it could be a Medicaid management system. Uh, the individual must not be able to use a phone in an emergency. They must be 14 years or older. Um, they are left alone for a portion of the day, and they must have the cognitive ability to use the device. So that's personal emergency response, often called PERS. Now let's look at the eligibility requirements for the CCC Plus waiver. People with a disability or of any, of any age or people 65 years or older, if they have mental illness, that does not qualify as a disability by itself. They must have some other disability and of course, they may have mental illness also. They must meet the criteria for a nursing facility and they must have a medical or nursing need. The Uniform Assessment Instrument or the UAI is the assessment tool used to determine if a person meets the three criteria. The UAI assesses a person's social, physical, and functional abilities. The screening is completed by a nurse from the health department, or if the person is in the hospital, the hospital staff does the screening. To request a screening for the CCC Plus waiver, this is part of the application process. The first thing you do is contact your local department of social services and it could be in your locality that you have to contact the local health department. Different areas uh, have either the health department or the Department of Social Services as the initial point of entry. So when you call, um, you need to be able to report your or your child's disabilities, you or your child's physical or health diagnosis, and you need to report what waiver services you need. You do not want to say that you want Medicaid to pay for therapies. Many, many people think that if they get this waiver, then they will have Medicaid, which they will, but they really only want it so that they can use it to pay for therapies. And if that's the reason you state that you want this, then they're not going to be very willing to uh, assess you for this waiver. So the screening may be done in the person's home or it may be done virtually or telephonically now, especially during COVID. When you call to request the screening, be prepared to answer these few questions. Now we're going to move over to the DD or the developmental Okay, looks like Lucy has another update. Yeah. Um, this is not so much an update, it's the way it's always been, but I want to make sure this point gets across. In the CCC Plus waiver, you heard that, that you have to have a diagnosis, you have to have a disability, you also have to meet the criteria for a nursing home. And for many people, and especially people with young children, they're like, well, my child is never going into a nursing home. 
But what they will ask you, what they should ask you is, if you do not receive this waiver, it, are you or your child, whoever the person is with a disability, um, at risk of going into a nursing home? If you say no, you're out. You're not gonna be found eligible for this waiver. So it's, it's kind of a hard concept for many people to get, uh, but you do have to say to be eligible for this waiver that um, the person who's applying for the waiver is at risk of going into a nursing home within 30 days. Wow, thank you for that. Sure. Disability waiver and the services that it provides. So what does the DD waiver pay for? You may remember earlier, we said that it has up to 32 services in it. So um, they fall into some broad categories such as employment and day options, consumer or self-directed options, residential services, behavioral crisis, medical services, and a pretty long list of others that are called additional options. You may remember earlier that in the DD waiver program, there are three categories of waivers. The different waivers have different services. So not all types of waivers have the same services. The three services, the three types of waiver are the community living waiver, the family and individual supports waiver, and the building independence waiver. When your needs change, you may request a different waiver to get the services that you need. So let's look at these three types of DD waivers. The building independence waiver is only for adults who are 18 years or older. Usually the person with a waiver owns or leases their own home or apartment. They're not living with their parents or their family. Um, and it is intended for people who have minimal support needs and need fewer services. The family and individual support waiver is for someone of any age, child or adult. The person may live in their own home or apartment or with friends or with family. And this waiver has more extensive supports, including medical and behavioral. And you can live, if you're an adult, with 24-7 support um, with this waiver and actually anyone of any age could have 24 seven support with this waiver. And the third waiver is the community living waiver. That's for people of any age. The person may live in their own home or apartment or with friends or with family. This includes extensive supports also, including medical and behavioral and 24 seven support. It is the only waiver with the segregated group home and sponsored residential services. So the main difference in DD waivers really comes in with residential services. You will see on the left on the chart, there are six residential support services there. Independent living services is only for people who have the building independence waiver and need fewer hours of training or support to live in their own place. It is not in the family and individual supports waiver or community living. Shared living is where a person lives with another support and receives some supports from the other person and it's available in all three waivers and this is for adults. Let's jump down to sponsored residential. In sponsored residential, two people may live with a waiver, may live with a family in the family's home, which is a licensed home. The group home service is only available to people with a community living waiver, like sponsored residential. So there you get a good picture of how different services are available in different waivers. There are many, many other waiver services and we're not gonna be able to have the time to go into all of these individually, but for employment and day services, um, for employment especially, supported employment as a service, workplace assistance, benefits planning, there is a group day set of services, those are usually center-based,
community engagement and community coaching are also available so that people are involved in their local community. Companion services, electronic home-based services, think smart home. There's community and employment trans uh, transportation. There's community guide, peer mentor supports. This waiver has skilled and private duty nursing and there are behavioral supports. But don't forget, in both the DD and CCC Plus waivers, there are those services that are in both waivers, personal care, respite, the PERS, assistive technology, and environmental modifications. So let's move on to who can be eligible for the DD waiver. So what is the definition of a developmental disability? It's a chronic disability before the age of 22 it's caused by a condition other than mental illness. And again, like the other waiver, a person may have mental illness, but they must have some other condition that's classified as a developmental disability. Um, the person needs or likely will need lifelong or extended plan services. And the person must have substantial limitations in three or more areas of life activity. And the life activities are self-care, communication, learning, mobility, self-direction, capacity for independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. Here are just some examples of conditions that may be a developmental disability, meaning they occurred before the age of 22. Autism, brain injury, cerebral palsy, Gantt syndrome, intellectual disability, muscular dystrophy, epilepsy, spina bifida. Again, those are just a few examples. So in the DD waiver, functional criteria is assessed. And a person's functional needs are assessed by determining to, excuse me, determining the level of help or assistance needed, whether it's from another person or from a mechanical or technology system compared to a person without a disability of a similar age. In the DD waiver, a person is assessed in eight different areas that you see listed on the slide, health, personal care, motor skills, communication, behavior, task learning, community living skills, and self-direction. For the DD waiver to be eligible, then the person must also be at risk of placement in an intermediate care facility for people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. The VIBES, the Virginia Individual Developmental Disability Eligibility Survey, is the assessment tool that's used to determine if the person meets the functional criteria for the DD waiver. And so it assesses the person's functional dependencies in the eight areas that we looked at on the previous slide. A representative from the local community services board does the VIDES assessment with the person who is seeking the waiver and any others they wish to be present and give information. For children, parents are always included, and for adults, often family members are included and help provide information relevant to what's asked on the VIDES. So when the VIDES is being done, it's looking at, again, what kind of help does the person need to perform skills or activities compared to a person of a similar age without a disability? This is a time when you focus on the challenges that the person ha has. This is a time where you're focused on the person's deficits. One thing that people often aren't aware of when they are having the VIDES assessment done is that we're to look at the individual's current functioning, presuming there are no help or helpers of any type available. So there are no parents, there's no family, no paid or unpaid service or technology is in place. So think about somebody getting dressed. There are many, many steps to getting dressed 
First of all, you have to know what uh, the weather is and what would be weather appropriate clothing. You have to be able to get your clothes out of the drawer or out of the closet. Um, can the person put their clothes on? Does someone need to tell them how to put their clothes on or do they need to physically help them put their clothes on? So think about the person as if no parents, no family, nobody else is around and how they would perform. The ARC of Virginia encourages individuals and families to learn more about the waiver services and the screening processes before requesting a waiver, before, excuse me, before requesting a screening for the CCC Plus and the DD waiver programs. We strongly recommend that you have a, your own copy of the VIDES or the UAI with you when the screening takes place. To request a DD waiver screening, you contact your local community services board. You want to be prepared to identify what your child's disability or developmental delay is, why you want a screening. And again, don't say you want to get this waiver because you want to have Medicaid to pay for therapies. You do not have to already have Medicaid to be screened. You don't have to have that for either of these waivers. But if you're offered a waiver, then you must uh, complete a Medicaid application. When you get screened for the DD waiver waitlist, you're going to be put on a waitlist. I'm sorry, when you get screened for the DD waiver, you're going to be placed on a waitlist. And this waiver, as we said earlier, has a large needs-based waitlist. Um, and waivers are awarded based on need. It's not a chronological wait list. If you're on the wait list, you may apply for individual and family support funds. And if it's a person who is able to live in their own place, so someone over the age of 18, and they maybe have an, the CCC plus waiver and they're waiting for the DD waiver, or if they have other natural supports and they can live in their own place, then rental assistance funds are available. With COVID-19, many changes have been made to the Medicaid system. Um, Medicaid, DMAS, and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services have made numerous changes to what is allowed in the Medicaid system. Some of these flexibilities include that parents of minor children, or spouses of people using waivers may be paid personal care attendance. And as we said earlier, that's until January 26, 2021. Face-to-face -face requirements for screenings, assessments, visits, planning meetings are not required and may be done virtually or somehow electronically. There are other flexibilities that have been made due to the coronavirus. And the ARC of Virginia has a website. It's our coronavirus website. And there you can keep up with the Medicaid flexibilities and changes because changes can happen at any time. You will find updates on a question and answer form, or let's say paper, that's especially for people with developmental disabilities, and we keep this updated as uh, changes occur. Help, maybe you need more information or you're overloaded. That's not unusual. Um, all of the information we have covered is on the ARC of Virginia's website and on YouTube. If you need help getting started and want to learn more about the screening processes for the waivers, feel free to contact us for individual consultations to guide you through this process. You may also want to view our presentation on what to do while you wait to learn more about the screening processes and what to expect. So our website is available to you. Um, you may call us at 804-649 8481. Email is info, I-N-F-O at T-H-E-A-R-C-O-F-V-A dot org. And we also have our YouTube channel. So please stay in touch with us and thank you for coming to this presentation. We would love to have your feedback 
And there you see again our website, email, telephone number. And we're also on Facebook and Twitter where you can stay in touch with us and keep up with what's going on. So again, thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was very helpful. Um, Lucy, uh, if you can, uh, I'm going to ask you to unmute for me. There was a couple of questions in the chat, um, if you don't mind addressing. Uh, one was regarding the, the PERS, the um, home modifications for security features. Um, it sounds like that might be um, more for people who have children that are high risk for elopement or something to that effect. Can they want, uh, the question was, um, in regards to that, could you speak a little bit more about what that covers? Okay, so home modifications or its formal name is environmental modifications in both of the waiver programs. Um, this is a service that, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes. This is a service um, that is very hard for many people to access. It seems to be very hard to get approval often from DMAS on this. So, Security features could be um, either assistive technology or a home modification, an environmental modification of some sort. If you have a care coordinator, that is the person to start with and then also work with your support coordinator if you have a support coordinator and you would have one if you're in the, um, in the DD waiver. It's really important to help the care coordinator and the support coordinator, case manager, know details, 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 why that item is needed. Sometimes you just might have to write up the justification for why that item is needed because often the care coordinator or the support coordinator really doesn't know the details well enough. So you've really got to kind of make the case yourself. Um, the issue about fences, it used to be that we could get fences approved. So let me clarify, I apologize, which is the question specifically says like an alarm system so we can know the minute they are going out the front door eloping. Yeah. So will it cover a new repair of existing fence? Mm -hmm. So it's both fences and home alarm system. Yeah, yeah. So. If we're moving on to fences, those used to be approved relatively easily. Um, it's very hard to get those approved now. In fact, in the Medicaid manual, it specifically says that fences are not allowed. We don't really know how, why that change got made, but that's what's in their manual now. Um, you can talk to your care coordinator, call, talk to the support coordinator, see if anything has changed about that, see if there's a way to make a strong enough case. In terms of repairing an existing fence, I really don't know if they will pay for repairs or not. Again, I talk to your care coordinator and support coordinator. There may be some other people on here who have experience that they want to share because Erica Jenkins is raising her hand. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna say, um, you know, if you are on the DD waitlist already and you are receiving IFSP money um, through the wait the waiver waitlist, you can use that money. You get up, you could possibly get up to a thousand dollars. So if you were approved for that, you could use that money to repair your fence. Um, that is something that's on the list of things that you can use IFSP money for um, if you qualify for that, if you're on the DD waiver wait list. So that's just an option um, to get your fence fixed. So if I can, if I may ask just to clarify for myself. So in my, my Monday through Friday job here, um, I own, a, I'm a physical therapist and I own my own practice that focuses on assisting people in um, through the process of acquiring equipment. And so one thing that I'm finding in a lot of the Medicaid programs is that they are stating they will not pay for items if it's purely for the safety of the child or the member. If you say it's for their safety, then it's denied. You have to have a medical reason 
why they need that equipment. And so, um, and then it seemed to be that if, if it was something we couldn't get passed through their regular insurance, that they could then with that insurance denial, they could put that towards the waiver, but it seems like there is not a blanket approval that that too is now going through an approval process. Can you speak a little bit more to what you're seeing on that side of things as far as waiver approval? Is it getting more stringent or is it still fairly open-ended? It is extremely stringent. Um, it, it's just been awful. And in fact, it is so awful that the Ark of Virginia has legislation now that's flying through the General Assembly. Thank you, whoever you want to thank. Um, and there will um, be a work group, and I hope there's somebody on this presentation who would like to bring her expertise to the work group, which will identify the barriers and the problems to hopefully come up with recommendations so that AT, assistive technology, virtual supports, and environmental modifications will be more readily accessible. I heard the most absurd story from someone who, um, this is a very physically disabled person, uh, everything, she has to be assisted with everything. Um, she's non-speaking. Um, she's a very young adult. She lives with her family. They have an accessible van, which is very much needed for her. And um, they were out on a road trip, kind of in a rural area, and their battery went dead. They didn't know at the time what was causing the car not to go anymore, but it was turned out it was the battery went dead. So that was kind of a problem. How were they gonna get their daughter out of the van and then get that wheelchair out. And then where was she, if they didn't have that, where was she gonna sit? So while they were waiting for AAA or whoever came to help them out, they began thinking, oh, this could be a problem. We kind of need to have a, a portable wheelchair available for her. So they applied for that, has the DD waiver, um, and they pleaded health and safety reasons. I mean, the fact that they're not approving things for health, health and safety, I, you know, doesn't make any sense to me. But anyway, I'm not the decision maker. So <clears throat> they went through two appeals. Okay, just let me finish my story, Shannon. They went through two appeals, <laughs> one on health, one on safety. And then the last um, time they went in, or requests, I should say, they said it was because she needed it so her personal care attendant could put her in her personal care attendant's car, take her to town to get ice cream. She needed it for community integration. It got approved. Shannon? And that's what I was going to say. Some of that is adding the word access, which is kind of what you just said. So sometimes you can't say it's going to be a safety component, but instead, you know, we may need this to be able to access this area. We can't access the backyard because it doesn't have an enclosure. So it's, it's a lot of playing with wording. And the big issue is with these six MCOs. Um, they're not all following Medicaid's guidelines. Exactly. So on the families that are trying to use, you know, I'm always saying, you know, if you have the MCO push to your caseworker, but a lot of times these caseworkers don't know the system. So then try and push back to a therapist or a therapist who may know that the systems more, but kind of access right now is a key word. So it's not, you know, being able to say it's just a safety component, but like you're saying, Lucy, on there, you know, we need to access it so now they can access the community. We need to be able to access the backyard. We can't access it right now because of this, this, and this. So, you know, it, it's it's so unfair. It doesn't make sense. But there's a lot of times if you play with the wording enough, you can get these things pushed through. Um, Lucy, thank you for that. And um, Shannon is a physical therapist uh, as well. And I know that she and I are part-time physical therapists and part-time creative writing specialists to get things approved. But yes, I've also found the word access to be very helpful. Um, some of the insurances, especially when secondary to Medicare, are only approving Medicare related bathroom equipment. 
Um, so the basic shower chair that you would get after a surgery is what they're only approving for a child with spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, which is appalling, but the word access is what I was able to use that they could not access the child's body to bathe them. And that was why they had to approve something else. So um, yes, definitely the wording. We need to stick together on that. And some of that too is even on the bath chairs is looking at you can line item those as miscellaneous codes. So on the families that you're getting denials on, um, we've had some issues like, you know, Melanie, you're saying they'll only pay for the $275 chair where the child needs full support. Well, you can then submit for the chair and under certain MCOs, you miscellaneous code everything and you're able to sneak them through. So it's, you know, it, it's unfair that there's not, you know, they're not doing things equally across the board. Um, right. But, you know, I mean, the good thing is don't give up because a lot of these things that are getting denied, um, if you're creative enough, then you can push them through another way. So it is, if, if you're hitting a road bump, like connecting with someone to see if there's another way to target it. Um, there is a question. Thank you, Shannon. There is a question um, from Sarah. Is there a cheat sheet for these types of tips of what to say and what not to say to get things approved? or to get on the DD waiver in general. I'm gonna take the first part of that and then I'm gonna um, pitch it to Lucy. So let me also just put out here, um, we are gonna do another program in two weeks that will have same time um, and we'll post the same sort of Eventbrite thing on our social media that will be reviewing these waivers, but it will be with um, CCC plus case managers, care coordinators, and service facilitators so that you know sometimes it's confusing who does what and not sometimes they don't even know what they do. So it would be good for all of us to know what they should be doing so we can help to advocate and facilitate the process. So that's going to be in two weeks. And then um, in March, I'm going to take um, a program. And Shannon, if you want to collaborate, I'm, I'm just going to pitch it out there. Um, we can talk later. But uh, a program on what equipment is out there because I'm finding there are a lot of families that don't know that you could get an alternative positioning device or what bathroom equipment is there or safety beds and that kind of thing. So I'll, I'm going to put together a program for March, just kind of putting out there, these are the kinds of equipment that's available, who to qual you know, how you qualify for all of that kind of thing. So um, I would say as far as when it comes to equipment, that that's really more on the therapists and the clinicians that are helping you getting the equipment to wordsmith that on your behalf. But as far as the DD waiver in general, um, Lucia, I'll pitch that to you. Somebody also said we applied CCC waiver when my baby was five months old. He has Down syndrome. We were denied. I think we should have applied DD waiver. So I'll let you take both parts of that, Lucy. So I'll take the, um, the rest of that question from Sarah. Um, she's looking for a cheat sheet on things to say or not to say. Most of that we have on our website or in um, recorded presentations that we have available. Um, we also do individual consultations. I can spend all day long talking to people, guiding them through the guide, uh, the vibes, the UAI, whatever, um, of what to say. So we are available to help people um, do that. So um, for this family that said they applied for the CCC waiver uh, when the baby was five months old. So what happens then is that they are again comparing that baby to a so-called typical five-month-old. There is not a lot of difference unless there's some huge medical things going on where a five-month-old with Down syndrome or whatever is going to be very different from a so-called typical five-month-old. You're having to do all the bathing, the diapering, the feeding, the changing. So the, your baby didn't get approved for the CCC plus when they were five months old, but maybe when your baby is older, the gap will be greater, but they also have to have that medical, uh, definite medical need. Um, just so everyone knows, you can apply request screenings for the CCC plus waiver and the DD waiver at the same time. Um, you could be receiving the CCC plus waiver and be on the waiting list for the DD waiver. 
when you get a DD waiver, then you are going to gladly give up the CCC plus waiver and um, accept the DD waiver. So I hope that kind of explains what may have happened with um, your five month old. Yeah, so now you're saying he's two years old now and very backed up. We will look into both again. Yeah, and feel free to call us. We'll be glad to go over any fine points that you may have questions about. And you will have to be saying that yes, for the CCC plus waiver, uh, your baby is at risk of going into a nursing home. And sometimes people say, well, you know, we're kind of a stable situation. Why would I say my baby's at risk or my child is at risk of going into a nursing home? Well, <clears throat> some people have children who do not sleep during the night and you're up all night with that child or you're providing medical care that they need during the night. Well, if that was me, I'm a person who has to have my sleep. If I don't have my sleep, I'm not gonna be able to take care of my baby. And maybe I have a partner, a husband or whatever. If something happens to my partner and he's not helping me, I can't do that by myself. So that could be an example of why somebody is truly at risk, uh, at risk of being placed into a nursing facility. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to ask a question, if I may, back on to um, the building independence DD waiver. Um, could you expound on what falls under independent living supports? I know that there's some people on the call tonight that um, either are living with support independently or want to, so or have children who are headed that direction. So can you expound on what that would be? The, the building independence waiver is that waiver that has the fewest amount of um, supports available, so people who uh, don't need a whole lot of support. This independent living support service, um, it's considered to be a skill building service to help that person become more independent in their living situation. It could be things like learning how to cook. It could be learning how to manage a stove. It could be um, making sure they're getting involved in their community, that they're um, making contacts with the community, that they know how to go find a gym and work out, um, anything along those lines. It's up to 21 hours per week of support. So compared to many other people who use waivers, um, that service is a, is a low amount of support. But that's just one of the services that's in that um, building independence waiver. They are, are, they are not giving out building independence waivers anymore unless it's a waiver that somebody had, a building independence waiver that someone had and they decided to give it up. So they're not funding new additional uh, building independence waivers. They almost couldn't give them away. Oh, wow. They really had a hard time with that. Okay. Not that you can't get one, but. Okay. Is there, if there's somebody who is currently employed and they want to move out on their own, how, is there any supports or waivers that would, they would qualify for? I'd seen things, but for more for people who are not yet employed, but if there's someone who is employed, but they couldn't live on their own, but want to, is there a waiver they would fall under? Yeah, they, they could fit under building independence. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we have a, another minute or two. Is there anyone who has a question that you can wave at me or w raise your hand or whatever? I can unmute you. Okay. You just need to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, so when you do finally get waiver services, you get one of the three, you, you wouldn't be tapping into all three? So when you say one of the three, do you mean one of the three DD waivers? Yes. Okay, so there's those three types of DD waivers. Right. And under each type, there are a number of services right. that are available. 
And you can use as many of those services as you need as are approved. So there's no limit. So I was just thinking that um, there was a, a family, I'm sorry, I can't remember them all. It was the independent living, and then there was the family and community, and then there was another. But so if if you if you use the family and community waiver, would you also be able to get um, help with teaching independent living skills? Yeah, so it's very hard to keep all those names straight. So if we were talking about the family and individual supports waiver, not the community living waiver. Right. Um, yes, there are services within that that um, teach you those skill building services to be more independent or to gain the skills you need that you want to learn. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's available. It has a different name. In-home residential supports is the name of one of the services that the person needs to increase their community engagement skills. There's community engagement. There's um, their employment services. So um, we have a chart on our website and it shows each of the three waivers and then which services are under each waiver. I see. So it's kind of, it sounds kind of like the Medicaid um, options, the, like Magellan and Aetna, that they have different options under, mm -hmm. under each Medicaid plan. Yeah. And so if you or your family member um, are in priority level one, um, you need to become really familiar with those three different types of waivers and what the differences are and which type of waiver has the services that you or your loved one is going to need. Because when the waivers are assigned, as they say, when the committee says, okay, you're gonna get a waiver, at that time, they're pretty much deciding which type of waiver you're going to get. Right. So you want to make sure you've communicated with the support coordinator which waiver would best meet your or your family member's needs. Okay, thank you. Waivers are a lot of work. It's work to get them and it's work to make them work. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, like I said before, um, we will post this on our, uh, our social media platforms and our YouTube channel. We will be posting more information about the programs in the coming weeks and hope that this was really helpful. Um, you can reach out to me directly. My email is Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E at thewholefamilyfoundation.com. If you have an idea for another program that would be helpful, if you have a resource that you're looking for, we want to kind of be that triage place um, for you to kind of help point you in the right direction. So thank you very much, Lucy, for your time. Thank you for all that you do for the community and for this wonderful resource. I know that it was a big help to everyone. So thank you all for joining us. Everyone stay safe and well. You too. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much.